I'm going to introduce um, um, Eleanor in the same way as I'm in introducing her to the fellows this evening when I take her to dinner. But, uh, she is a graduate of the University of Rome. She is a native of these spectacular mountains where she stayed for me. And I also add that she is an archer, a fencer, <laughs> <laughs> and also the daughter of a general. So what better person to give a talk on violence and identity in her homeland? Over to Eleanor. Thank you, Simon. <laughs> um, I think uh, it's a really show. Yeah. Um, totally like thank you, Simon, thing. for well, first of all, for inviting me. Like, it was not a proper invitation. It was more like you're talking. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, thank you, Simon, of course, for inviting me for this presentation. And um, I'm going to talk today about uh, violence in the Iron Age Mediterranean mountains, and uh, especially. <laughs> I think we have to leave this one. Uh, oh, you're supposed to. Oh, uh, because of the. I'm going to try and find it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, just, just to let you know, if those lights are off, no, we're not playing. Yeah, yeah, that's right. It's so, all. Yeah, it's all. Right. <laughs> I don't know if that's good or bad, but that's all right. <laughs> Anyway, so um, today I'm going to talk about Mediterranean mountains uh, in the Iron Age, but on the uh, through the lenses of violence, and especially I'm going to address the topic of warrior societies, the so-called warrior societies. And um, this is just a sort of uh, short version of, of my PhD. And um, but I think that the two main issues bothered me a lot while I was writing this presentation and while I was writing the PhD. And it's uh, this two. The first one is that identity and violence, they have this sort of weird relationship that is both obvious and counterintuitive. So I, I, I really had some difficulties to uh, put this uh, relationship on focus. And the second one, and it was an ethical issue, actually. I think that the uh, previous talks, they really, um, they really highlighted how violence is a very delicate topic. And when we're talking about violence in the past, uh, we have this detached eye that is the archeologist and the anthropologist eye, and we are scholars and we are academics. And of course, we are very excited about whatever we're doing. We are uh, excited because that's our nature, but we don't have to forget. We, we, we need to remember that violence is always violence, even when it happened millennia ago or centuries ago. So um, it's always, uh, we have always to be very careful about what we say and what we are reading and what we are, um, uh, and how we are, uh, narrating how we are telling the story that we are talking about. So uh, that's that's the point. That's uh, that's how archaeology of violence always comes with an extra layer of bias. Of course, archaeology is always biased, but um, in this in this case, has an extra layer of bias and comes from the fact that in a in a in a present day scenario, of course, the victim there is the, there is the perpetrator and there is the observer. That's how the anthropology of of it works, but um, when it comes to the archaeology, we have a gap between us and whatever happened centuries ago. So we, we don't know how bias is the source that we are the source that we're reading. It can be part of the victim story, can be part of the perpetrator story, or can be a, a, a point of view based on the observer story. And sometimes they are so blurred together that we cannot actually recognize which is which. So we have to be extra um, uh, extra careful when we are doing this when we are uh, talking about violence in the in the past. Um, let's say, um, let's go back to the origin of, of violence, not in time, but in but conceptually. So, um, violence is rooted into competition, but a competition occurs when two or more individuals, population or species, simultaneously use a resource that is actually or potentially limited. But conflict is not necessary, always violence, because Otherwise, the academic world would be a very dangerous place. <laughs> but, but it's not. So there is not um, um, uh, an obvious relationship between com uh, competition and violence. So violence occurs only when it's the most efficient way of solving this, this competition. And I think that uh, many studies in later years, especially those like, for example, the one by Grossman on killing, um, it's um, 
they um, they highlighted they, they they were made on modern populations on um, veterans from the Afghanistan. But uh, what they they um, highlighted is that close range violence is really hard for our brain. Like we have like a barrier in our brain that prevents us to do that. So we have to do an extra effort to go into close range violence, of course, range violence, of course, uh, long range violence still happens and still have and close range violence still happens, but it's only the very last resource for us. So it's not, it's not that obvious. It's not automatic. It's not like competition equals to violence and close range violence. So there are multiple steps here. And, and then violence is not necessary war. I'm not going to talk about war because I think that next few, next um, next talks they are going to talk about it very very thoroughly. So it's not it's not a topic that I will for here. Uh, so how can we define violence? Uh, so a violence is an act of physical hurt deemed legitimate by the performer and some of the witnesses in the in the. Um, definition that Bridges um, gave, and it, this is an act, it, it is an act of social performance that states an ideological message in front of an audience. I, I just want to highlight how um, every word in this, in this definition, it comes from a performative kind of semantic field. So violence is, a, is, a, is, a, is an act, of course, and uh, something practical is something of course, very, very concrete, but it's also a performance. It needs to be displayed. It needs to be legitimate then. Uh, so it's, uh, it, it goes through not only the proper act of committing violence, but also the, uh, the huge range of symbolic actions that are around the concept of violence. And because violence, to be effective on our, on our, on our community and social level, needs to be legitimate. So, um, the most efficient way of legitimizing violence is through uh, the manipulation of, of memory and uh, especially of the past. So uh, these are three aspects of the legitimacy of violence. So it recreates models and behaviors from the <clears throat> past. So that means that it manipulates the, um, the creation of memory, that manipulates the, the past, and it, um, it, 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 it transforms into something that can be used to legitimate violence uh, it appeals to strong feelings of social closure and identity. Of course, this is part of the uh, the entire concept of violence. It's us versus someone someone else. So it has to be rooted in uh, identity. And uh, it is the most direct way of asserting these two things. Of course, uh, propaganda, I think, is the uh, higher example of the combination of these two things. Um, but violence is also, as we say, uh, it, it only, it's not only dividing people, but it's also uniting them, like some, somehow it's creating a, a bond between people. So violence is also an act of association. Uh, so the people involved in violence, they create bonds with the people that are on the same side, but also with the opponents. So there is a huge, it's a very deep and dramatic cognitive experience that creates a bond between the people sharing the same field, the same uh, battlefield, or the same uh, moment of extreme violence. It's an extreme emotion that comes to, when it comes to violence. So um, the, this, when, when this violence, when this, uh, when this uh, emotion is protracted through time and it, it's shared by an entire community, it creates like a, a, a new social pattern that are, that are Bonding together, of course, the people on the same side and the opponents all together, like in a, in a very complicated pattern. And that's where it comes the uh, definition that Male Shadich, I don't know if I probably pronounce it wrong. <laughs> um, it's, uh, it's giving of the social potency. So it's not an individual uh, attribute, it's not, it's not something related to the single person, but it's more like a social. Um, uh, it's a social phenomenon that comes from the interplay of all these elements that converge into creating uh, a, a bigger, uh, a bigger idea that it's social pregnancy. So the 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 the, the social uh, act of, of violence. So to sum up this brief um, um, theoretical introduction, so um, four points are the main ones. So first one. Close rate violence is rare and only occurs when it's the, just the last resource. So, uh, violence at a community level can be understood as social pregnancy, and then it's uh, as the result of uh, of all the um, contingency, contingencies concurring uh, to it. 
And then violence is a social act that needs legitimation, and this happens mainly through the manipulation of uh, memory and the past. And violence is a form of association that creates new social factors between people of the same side and people uh, on the opponent side. So now I'm coming to the uh, case study. Uh, the case study area is Mediterranean mountains. Uh, as many of you already know, they are very delicate and a very um, uh, very delicate environment with a limited amount of resources. And this means that they are uh, subject to cyclical overshot of population. It means that the population goes on, goes, uh, goes up, and then for some reason drops and then, and then so on, because it has to maintain the balance of, of population. But this, this, this overshot, they are regulated by um, various events, usually like um, conquest, war, violence, migration, colonization. It's not always violent, of course. Sometimes it's just a peaceful movement of people. Um, but violence is, 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 a, is a thing. Um, and also, um, mountains are very rare um, environments for the fact that the centralization is not, is not something that can easily happen. So, um, so they are uh, just very fragmented, isolate, isolated place, uh, places where everything happens slowly than the valley floors, and sometimes it doesn't happen at all. So this, these are these are very detached landscapes, but they're not so detached. They're still part of the of the system, but they're somehow that where things happen in a different way. Uh, and also for this very reason, the relationship between landscape and uh, identity of the people inhabiting it is very is very tight. Um, so mountains, so for this reason, being a very delicate environment, they always uh, constantly they constantly between change and slow pace. Very they always between uh, uh, a resistance to change to. Uh, change their ways, but at the same time, they're very attached to tradition because things can change very, very quickly in the mountains, but they can stay the same for, for centuries. So at the same time, mountain, mountainous people, mountain people, they are ready to change their, their ways of living, but adapting their ways of living at a new situation. So it's it's this um, counterintuitive relationship between mountains and people. So that's my study, study area. So that's... Um, uh, I don't know if you can see it. That's that's Italy. That's cool. <laughs> and that's uh, the uh, the Apennine. Um, the, here I put the historical names by which these people are known. But there is no real um, there is no real uh, proof that they were using this these names already in the time that I am going to uh, present here in this uh, in this um, in this talk. And the uh, economic resources. resources uh, are very limited. There are mainly these two uh, huge plateaus. They are grazing land, and they're still used today for for, for uh, grazing land. And then there is this central plateau that it's uh, kind of good for um, for agriculture, but it's not that good. It's essentially uh, for lentils and uh, this type of this, no grain, no wheat, not nothing like. Uh, it's essentially just lentils. And this wine, this one is the only real valley that can be used for any kind of agriculture because it's a proper Mediterranean climate with uh, the possibility to produce olive oil, wine, and all the usual Mediterranean stuff. Uh, so that's the chronology that I'm going to talk about. Uh, this is, I will focus on phase two, uh, not because phase one and phase three are not interesting, but just because phase two is the one where uh, the uh, the phenomenon of violence is more evident, um, and it's uh, it's a period that goes from the end of the seventh century up until the middle fifth century BC. Uh, whatever happens after the mid century BC, fifth century BC, sorry, uh, it's um, it's kind of uh, blurred and not clear. So um, we are stopping by the mid fifth century BC. Um, so that's um that's the landscape again. These are the people around them, and if we focus on the uh, on the geomorphology of this of the area, we realize that there are very clear boundaries with very clear very few passageways. Like this is one. Uh, this this here. This is the Gran Sasso. This is a huge 
wall of rock. It's impossible to cross, even in the, in a, during the um, during the, the the summer. It's it's really hard to to cross. Uh, and again, here is another passage, another pass here, and here it's a bit more um, open. And this is kind of a buffer area. It's uh, it's you can enter from this point and this point, but this part is pretty much open. And so in white here, there are all the passageways that lead into the into the area. Um, but if we look very closely, we can actually divide the territory, the, the, the internal part of the territory in other four areas. So one is here, the second one is this point, and the third is point, and that's the fourth. So one, two, and three, they're Sorry. <laughs> one, two, and three, they're actually valleys, while the fourth one is proper mountain, the bracket landscape with uh, no proper valleys, so just few small valleys, but nothing serious. So the, the, the main ones, there are these three valley floors. So if now we, um, we look at the hill forts, it is clear that they really wanted to defend their borders because if we overlap the, um, the, pass the passes and the, the, the and the borders that we said in the previous uh, slide, we realized that they actually defending all the passes and the this one here and the second one here, they were really worried about this one, I think. Um, this one as well, they, um, currently they are protecting this entrance, but not this one. Um, and here, this is a very open border. So, uh, but they are also protecting the internal borders. So here, that's that's a quite clear line. And here as well, this is, and all this uh, part is all defended. And here, that's a very, very clear line. So, um, they were they felt the need for some for some reason to defend the territory to control the territory not only the, the the external border but the internal border as well they they literally every valley uh wanted to control their own territory their own family. and um this is more or less the, uh, the dimensions of these of these hill courts so there are the small ones that are just Tower or watchtowers or something like this. And the medium ones, they're usually, well, the small ones, they're usually up in the mountains, a very remote place. Uh, the medium ones, they're the one actually controlling the, 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 the actual borders. And the, uh, the large ones, they're actually at, this, at the center of each valley, and it's just the three for them. So if we look at this um, uh, in uh, at the one of the the main ones. So the main one, this is one is Montecerro, five hectares. It's pretty big actually, and it has it has a gate, and here there is a postern, and it's a quite complex uh, system of, of fortification. And the same thing can be said of the settlement of Colle de la Battaglia, where it's very complicated. There are two lines of fortification. There are uh, also, there is a postern here. There are there is a gate here. There is another gate here, and here there is a uh, um, a terrace that is uh, actually giving more fortification to a specific area of the of the of the settlement. So they it's not all display here. There is also something that they, they were kind of worried for some reason. So they actually fortify their the settlement in a proper way. Uh, these are the small ones. Not all of them has been excavated. So it's actually no one of them has been excavated. So they're only known from surveys and um, and yeah essentially from surveys. So this is one of them, and this is another one of the small ones. It's interesting to note that this one has a rampart or a sort of enclosure, and it has been interpreted as, a, as an enclosure for animals. So they, they were protecting people, but maybe mm, mostly animals. So that's, that's an interesting point. And that's Montevoy, another, another one of those uh, middle-range um, settlements. But um, there are also similarities. These are all the ev funerary evidence of the uh, of the area. So a huge amount of funerary evidence, actually, for such a small place. Uh, but only four there have been properly studied, and only four of them is actually um, um, a proper similarity, like with um, more than ten tombs, actually. 
Uh, so these are Bossa, Baxano, Cinturelli, and Capistrano. I'm going very briefly to them. So Baxano is the big, biggest one. Uh, it's a very, very um, large area. So I'm not going into detail because otherwise it would be another lecture. <laughs> but um, it's 1,662 tubes. And uh, this is, again, uh, along one of the roads that goes from the Sabina to toward the coast. And I'm just, I will just focus on one of the best preserved uh, sections of the necropolis. And this is, um, this is a road. This is another road. And it's interesting that this is the only part where tumuli were preserved in this, in this necropolis. Um, and they are all very visible from the road. Like anyone walking through that one would see every single uh, one of this, uh, of this, uh, of this, of this tumuli. Uh, Fossa is the necropolis where the tumuli have been found like most mostly preserved because the here there is the, the river, and there were a couple of floods during the during the, the, the centuries. So they are mostly all of them. They are mostly preserved. And um, here it is. So these are the two lines. Right? This 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 corridor here. It's it's not it's not it, it's it's fake. It's not it was not there just to show how it was at the at the uh, at the at the. Yeah, <laughs> at the inside of it, but um, yes, that's uh, that's how a tomb uh, is made, and they have standing stones like a sort of tail departing from the tumulus and like the you know the standing order. So the first one is the is, sorry, is the tallest <coughs> one, and then it's just descending into uh, a small a small stone. So uh, these are very visible monuments. That's that's the point. They are very visible from any point in the landscape. They are usually on flat land, so uh, wherever you're walking through the through the landscape, you can actually see them. Like they're at the at the bottom of the valley, they're visible from any possible way in the uh, in the landscape. And this uh, this is Cinturelli. This is uh, here. There are no tumuli again because they haven't been found. But all the graves, they're all aligned through uh, to 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 the to the road that was crossing the the, the cemetery. So again, every grave was very visible from 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 the road. And this is Capistrano. Capistrano is more like a funerary system than a proper necropolis because there is a huge amount of different uh, evidence uh, all scattered in the in the landscape. But um, the main one, uh, the one that has been dug more uh, thoroughly, is this one, uh, and it's actually where the warrior of Capistrano, the famous statue, uh, statue come from. And um, again, this is the road, <laughs> and every single one of these graves are very visible, and the warrior of Cavestrano had to be very visible as well. Now, um, going to through material culture. Uh, so this is the basic part of the <laughs> of the of the of the of the scene warrior. There is a spear, a sword, and a dolium, usually plus a drinking set made of a cup and a jug. But we're going to focus here on. Uh, weapons. It's interesting to note that um, this 17% uh, slice of the male burials is the only one that is not armed. They don't have weapons. So all of the all of the others, almost 80% of the male population has uh, weapons. Being that a, a sword or a spear, it's uh, as you can see, it's uh, usually uh, it's all of them, but sometimes. It's just one of them. But anyway, so they are all armed. Most of the male population is armed. So this is the kind of sword that we usually see in the area. It has a leaf shape. It's um, not very long. It's not super long. It usually doesn't, um, it doesn't exceed 90 centimeters, but it's uh, pretty long for, for, the, for, the, for the standard of the other parts of Italy and uh, uh, has a slight sheet of balance toward the point. So it's uh, very good for trusting and cutting. So it's a very versatile weapon. And the white base of the blade, uh, this, this one, is actually good for strong parries and then gives a very strong resistance against mechanical stress of the, of the fight. And uh, it's uh, actually useful for the thumb to, um, you put the thumb, your thumb here, so that you can actually control very well the blade. So these are very versatile and dynamic weapons. Uh, spears and javelins, they're usually divided by the length of the, of the blade, but this has been uh, uh, contradicted by, by a very um, 
well, a quite recent study from Hammer and his, um, and his uh, team, and they uh, made some studies on Bronze Age uh, weapons, and they realized that short, uh, short blades, they actually presented traces of melee combat, with, which means that it's not obvious when it comes to this kind of weapons to say like, oh, the short one, it must be the javelin because it's easy to throw. That's, that's not probably true. So we have to be a bit more critical when we look at these different kind of, of blades. So we don't, we are not sure which one was for melee combat and which which was not. Maybe they were both for, for again, a very dynamic way of fighting. Uh, the defensive gear is kind of the blind spot in this in this argument because we don't have defensive gear. Like there is this kind of fuel, I guess, this protection for any heart, but they are of a uh, previous period, essentially. Well, it's not a previous period, but the early part of this of the period in exam. And they are a prerogative of very rich burials. So they maybe were, maybe these ones, they were made of bronze and the others they were not, or maybe they, I, I, we don't know actually. And the second thing is that we don't have shields, which is weird, which is very weird. But there is the fibula um, of Fitzoli, which is um, an incredibly that has been found uh, in, not in the, in the case study area, but in a valley close by and it's from an acropolis that has been given to the 8th century BC and this guy here is bringing this kind of weaker shield so uh, it's possible that actually the shield were made of um, perishable material like this kind of, of thing like a sort of medieval buckler like sort of small shield and that's um, that's not directly related to violence, but it's actually giving us the the, the, the idea that these people they really knew their 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 their, um, their uh, landscape, and they moved through the landscape with a sort with a, with confidence. And in fact, the uh, most of the cases of this mountain gear they come from um, from warrior people, <laughs> uh, and these are iron reinforced shoes and crampons and ski poles, that's, uh, that's an interesting one, and omega, uh, omega boot poles, so that, that, that's the reconstruction that has been made, so they were probably to be tied together some sort of, of woods of some sort. And uh, this, this gives us the impression that these people, they really know how to move through the landscape, and they, they needed to, they, they, th those warriors, they needed to move through, through the landscape. So um, just to give an idea of the fighting technique that these people may have, it was, probably a very loose formation based on the use of spears as the main weapon. So both has a melee and a range of weapon and mm -hmm. um, consistent with small, small groups moving steadily, uh, steadily through, the, through the landscape and then um, wearing just a, def a light defensive gear and with an agile secondary weapon such as a dagger or a small sword, a uh, short bladed short, uh, sword like uh, the, the one we, that we have seen. Um, very quickly, going through the uh, warrior of Capistrano, he, this is the only proper artistic uh, depiction that we have from, from the area, the, the, the only uh, figurative art that we can actually uh, put together. Uh, and he has this very weird helm that is hardly functional. Honestly, I would never go into a bottle with the helm, <laughs> honestly. Uh, but uh, the, 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 the best comparison comes from Morlo, of course, like every Etruscologist here thought the same thing, uh, from, from Morlo and it, uh, uh, in Etruria. And it may be a sign of rank or maybe a sign of being a, an ancestor or like uh, something like that. And probably Giovanna will have a, a much better insight into the Morlo experience. But, uh, so it's not, it's definitely not a functional object at this point. And this is the kind of Pulex, uh, Pulex that we have seen in the previous uh, slide. So uh, there is no doubt to, to that they, they were functional. There is no reason to doubt their the functionality, even if sometimes they are decorated, but display and functionality doesn't exclude each other. They can be functional and nice at the same time. Uh, and the grades, they are like, very weird because they are not accepted in, a, in any possible way in the case study area, but they're still present outside of the case study area and uh, on the coast, on the coastal part of, of Bruxa, of the, of the region, or in the southern part of it. So they're still kind of in the same cultural, material cultural uh, entourage of these people, but they're not directly, directly related to, to them. Um, while the shoes they're attested, as we have seen just 
just a few moments ago, uh, mountain shoes there, they, they were uh, a very, uh, a very useful thing. So uh, going through the weapon, so the sword, it's, uh, it's an actual sword, uh, it's the one that we're seeing. It's interesting that this is very nicely decorated with two male figures in two different registers, so maybe kind of make that was known from, from the people, um, like, who knows? Uh, and there is a knife uh, that is associated with the scabbard. This sometimes happens, but it's not very common. So maybe uh, this is a sign of rank again, or something like this. Maybe it's a Weston, right? The 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 axe. Uh, it's sometimes present in early burials, but it's not it's not in in the same chronology of with with the rest of the gear. So that that's that's weird. That's 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 not. That's not consistent with the chronology of the rest of the gear and the spears, as we have seen them. There are many of them, so it's nothing uh, really, really new. Uh, description has been interpreted by Adriano La Regina, and it has been translated as Aninius had me made beautiful image or statue for King Nevis Pompulaeus. And this is, I think, that the interesting thing. Uh, I mean, there are a lot of interesting things, of course, about this description. But the interesting thing for us now is this word king. So we 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 have a king, but what what does being a king really mean? It can be a king, but it can be like a king in a, in a modern way, or it can be like a, a a chief, a leader, or something like this. So we are not very sure. Like the the, the word is king, right? Mm -hmm. But it's not clear what actually this king word means. Uh, and now coming to the osteological data, um, the analysis made on the skeletons of Bassano, they shown that there is actually a, a humoral symmetry, and this has been interpreted as traces of training with uh, asymmetrical weapons such as swords and uh, like one handed swords and uh, spears. And uh, com comparing this with uh, the other necropolis of the area, so Posta, Barishano, San Pio, and Cinturelli, uh, it's, uh, the, 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 the picture is slightly different because high, medium, high to medium asymmetry uh, is not different in armored and in unarmored individuals in the grave. So this is not, this is um, uh, counterintuitive dating because there is no direct correlation between having a weapon in, in the grave and actually having this uh, humoral symmetry, but um, this is probably more have to do with the with the with the cultural meaning of bearing a weapon together with with the, with the individuals rather than the actual training, because actual traces of violence are very common again. But this is Batsano, as you can see, uh, most of the uh, traumas they all attested in uh, a male. Skeletons. This is like this is a huge uh, this is a huge uh, difference between male and female uh, skeletons. So they have been correlated to some manly <laughs> manly activity, such intra-community violence and uh, violence in uh, in general or training and this kind of activities. So just to conclude, um, I think that um, <coughs> to reconnect with the initial uh theoretical introduction uh i think that we can actually see here in the case study area we can actually see all the elements that we uh analyze for the for the um definition of violence so there is a is, is a i think that the existence of an internet personal sorry the personal close range violence in the case study is very well supported by the presence of heat force of both functional weapons and osteological traces of violence and trauma and all the representative uh, system of memory and, 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 and warrior valor of the warrior of Capistano. Um, the conflict over resources in the case area probably escalated at some point into violence because maybe the environment was not very favorable and they saw probably uh, violence as the most viable way of getting out of the, of the problem. And so uh, this violence forces the community in two directions. For one, the limitation of population, so they, they kept control over the, the average population. And the second point is that probably this system of violence, of recognized and uh, regularized violence, uh, um, help the circulation through rate economy of, of resources. So um, they uh, both result in a level leveling of 
power between community with the occasional emergency of powerful leaders and the, the, the leveling of population. So memory and ancestors narrative is the main funerary feature in the area. So both through Tumulai, Stele, and uh, uh, the, the warrior of Capistrano statue and everything that it's uh, around the funerary system is focused on memory, on memory of the ancestors. And the case study area, uh, despite the clear traces of violence, so, uh, shows a significant degree of cultural unity. So they are all part of a, of a single cultural system that actually expresses itself through the warrior identity. So in this case, violence was, a, was a, uh, an element that unified and, and actually divided this, this people. Um, to conclude, violence that happened uh, in the field for these people has much happened, like not outside of the field. So it was has much uh, uh, actual actual violence, has much as um, performed violence through memory and and display. Um, this this system somehow changes, and and this balance is is broken by something that happened by the mid fifth century BC. Again, it's not it's not clear what happened, but it's a it's a huge is a is a huge um, um, system of of elements like a, a, a huge amount of uh, of of things that happen all together in Italy, and they all bring to the famous crisis of the fifth century and. It, clearly, it, it involved uh, the, the area as well. So this, this crisis somehow broke this, this balance and it changed everything. And then Roman came and yeah, that's another story. <laughs> so thank you. Um, that's, that's it. Thank you for a very persuasive description. <laughs> Illustrated from all these sorts of dimensions. I have some major questions, but I'll, I don't want to run lately. But uh, my major question is, where do women fit into this picture? That's a very good question. And, and also, how and the sort of background question is, how, how pervasive is this violence? Is it something that is celebrated through memory in order to impose a will? Or is it, um, is it a male exaggeration? <laughs> and this is a big sort of debate. Well, um, answering the first question, women, uh, that's a very interesting question because they are virtually invisible, but they're not, they, they're not very well represented because they're not very clear from the funerary, um, from the funerary record, and they can only be seen for certain just from osteological analysis. But osteological analysis, they're not, there are some osteological analysis, but we need more of them, actually. <laughs> we always need more of them, actually. But um, but it's I think it's interesting to um, to point out, like for example, in this uh, in this light here, what's it's in, it, it's interesting is that there are not many traumas on women. So somehow they were not fighting each other at home. Let's say so um, we don't really know what they were doing, but they were represented somehow but not for us like they were part of the community somehow but they they are not very clear for us so they are outside of this of this system there are no warrior women uh there are a couple of graves where there are some um doubts let's say on the on the actual uh sex of the of the of the deceased but uh i wouldn't include them to say oh there were warrior women it's uh they're, they're, they're mostly men so that's uh, that's it. And the second question was: um, How does one quantify this? And I, mean, I suppose there is the evidence for quantification. How how pervasive was this um, this warfare, this violence? Was it did, uh, did people live in fear, <laughs> right? or was it? Um, here are a few examples, and and it was sort of by that example that um, the identity was created. Well, I think at the the fact that there were so many weapons for such a long period of time, uh, I think that it speaks for itself because you can be, you can keep the display on for maybe a generation, mm -hmm. but these are more than, these are at least four generations of, of people wearing weapons, having traumas, living in hill mm -hmm. and like having the entire cultural system shaped on defense, control, and, and violence. So, 
I think that at some point, sometimes it happened, but violence happened probably seasonally. It makes sense if we if we look into a, a race economy uh, model that's probably happened uh, seasonally. But uh, I think that they 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 were pretty afraid at some point. <laughs> it fits very well with what Ian Armin said last week. Uh, yeah, that's true. That's that's very true. Which is very shocking. I, I was kind of shocked. How pervasive this actually Anyway, I mustn't ask any questions. Are there other questions? Yes. Uh, thank you for um, the time talk. Uh, I have a very small question. Is there any correlation between this, uh, you know, you mentioned the warrior identity in the burial custom and the age group of the deceased male? Uh, actually, um, no, meaning that all the adults, they all the ma adult males, they actually, uh, Except for that twenty percent, they're all represented as, as as warriors. So maybe more more uh, precise sociological analysis will tell us more about the uh, the differences in age, maybe in the apparel wearing the of warriors wearing different weapons or like the combination of spears and swords and stuff. But I, I think that right now it's it's clear that it's a uh, it's um it's a pervasive element of all the all the ages all the adults ages because well children that they don't have weapons usually sometimes they have but it's a uh, it's a uh, it's rare okay. <laughs> yes. i actually have a question about the 20 percent yeah <laughs> so do these people have traumas like violent in violence induced traumas or not well were they usually <laughs> not uh usually not there are a couple of them that actually have but uh they also have some of them they also have uh humoral symmetry so they were somehow trained oh, okay. to, to to do that they they for some reason they were not represented as warriors but uh they apparently they still would pick out weapon and, and fight some of them not all of them but some of them <laughs> thanks for a lovely presentation Anna. It, can I play devil's advocate again, yeah. a bit like I did last week? So, uh -huh. I mean, I work with communities, contemporary communities, who are often publicly portrayed as violent societies characterized by male led dominant ideologies of conflict. And that ethnographically has been massively debunked. Mm -hmm. it, 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 you, you get a male display of certain kind of warrior characteristics. Um, but the, the the reality of these societies is is much less conflictual at all. Mm -hmm. Involves all kinds of uh, collaborative mechanisms that go across ethnic boundaries, etc. Although there are elements of internal conflictual relationships around age and gender, which are which can, uh, sort of make that picture a much more nuanced thing. So, I mean, my devil's advocate sort of playing here would be you've got um, barrels with armor but uh but only or weaponry but only some bits of that so you've got missing other parts of the armor and weaponry that are not there which is quite interesting you've got asymmetry but it doesn't correlate with the weapons so you have to ask the question does it come from something else people farm or whatever mm -hmm. you've got cultural unity you've got a warrior image who looks like a warrior but he doesn't look overly aggressive you've got um your argument for shields maybe are missing because they decompose well what does that say about the entire rest of the material culture mm -hmm. so all of your pots and baskets and everything they all disappear and you're left with your metal and spears you've got um uh so so the my question here and it's only playing devil's advocate just to put you on the spot because i know you can handle it, <laughs> but it, it, it yeah. is this repeating a long-standing research and androcentric research bias that focuses on male things and is obsessed with exciting what's perceived as exciting stuff like conflict um, and then means that we don't look for the other bits of evidence. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, um, no, that, that's a, a super interesting question. I think that this is a back to the point where we are biased when we look at this kind of, of evidence, because now we only have the most shiny part of it, let's say, the blink part of the of the of the archaeological um, record here. And I I I still think that if 
something is so evident in the in the in the archaeological record, then there must be a reason. But as you say, there must be an entire war beyond this one. And that's why I think it's interesting to see the display part of it. Like this is violence were performed because there are traces of it, but there is a huge amount of, of, of part of, of parts of, of, of the daily life where violence is just was just like something there but not really like happening in everyday life uh, and I think that this is um, an interesting topic that maybe it should be uh, explored more the fact that the the, the the warrior is a warrior on the battlefield let's say or during the, the act of performing violence but at some point these people they were uh, what they were, they were shepherds, they were farmers, they were like normal people. So how do they play this switch from the warrior and the normal person? Because um, as every single study on PTSD mm -hmm. and uh, um, veterans and everything else say that, that the act of killing is a very traumatic act. So uh, whenever someone gets back to normal life, there is always something off. In this person, so uh, that's that's the point where how this violent society merges into the civil and everyday uh, life. But it's it's very hard to get it archaeologically. So uh, that's 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 the part that's the shady part that we don't see in the in this picture. That it's uh, the, the the shadow of the of the shiny uh, weapons part of the of the story. But yes, I think that that's why we need more theological data. That's why we need more. Uh, uh, more data on women, on uh, unarmed people, and who, may, who knows, maybe the were slaves and stuff, but we don't see that because, yeah, they're covered by this. <laughs> yes. And that's, a, that's a rotten question to ask for your opening viva. <laughs> it would have been the second question. <laughs> this is the kind of, I don't believe the women this time. It's open question. You don't want to. <laughs> anyway, she did it very she well in this opportunity. So, um, <laughs> this is that particular one, <laughs> the particular thing we're looking at there, does that mean, is it what almost 15% sort of, of the male skulls have got trauma? Is that what that means? The top line? Uh, is it 15% you know, of, 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 of all the male skulls have got? Or is it 15 out of the three out of the something? <laughs> uh, no, I think it's a, per a percentage. I have to check actually because I uh, I don't remember right now. But um, yeah, I think it's a it's a percentage. It That's looks like it is. This is good. Less than that. It is interesting, you know, that that they are these skull and not the hands, not not the arms and legs. So there is a kind of ritualized violence going on, which I know people have found in some like Neolithic societies, like in Denmark, where where they. You know, the skulls have got massive wallops as if males are sort of whacking each other. Yeah. Um, so, but the other thing I was going to say, you, you've got this evidence for you know, the kind of small scale ritualized, whatever, whatever's going on. But when you start off, you also showed that map, which you showed, if you like, there was a bigger structure to that landscape with those, you know, the little forts that which are there defending the entrance into the territory, defending from what, you know, and and who's and how's that being organized? On the one hand, you have these, you know, this world of this stuff, which is competing little villages or whatever they are, with this with these male violence, if you know, if it's that real. At the same time, you start off by showing you know a, a sort of you know quite it's quasi well the, you know, it's, it's the center base, the Etruscans and all the rest, you know, how how quasi states are they organized? But you know, what what are those what are they defending against? I think that they were defending against each other. <laughs> yeah. uh, I think that they were very worried, like that. What you suggest is, you know, there are these big, one or two really big settlements, kind of centers of population. Uh, and then you've got these little fortlets guarding the ways into the larger territory. Well, that, that's I, something different. Yeah, and I think that um, I didn't have much of the time to explore that part, but I think that there is a much uh, structured um, territorial unity. So all, all these valleys, they are like single unities in the territory and they act like in a very compact, in a very um, compact way with a central uh, settlement that is not a, a city, there is nothing like close to a, a, a urban center, there is nothing 
related between this kind of central settlement and urban center. So they're not urban centers, but they, they kind of act like a sort of center for, for a, a bigger unity, let's say a sort of extended concept of a urban center so that they have like the, the central settlement and then there are like those medium-sized settlements like crowning the, the valley and all, all these little outposts and watchtowers controlling everything. So if you watch that, is that something, that's something very different from your ritualized male folks? Yeah. So there's, there's different levels of, of violence or non-violence or defense or... Well, watchtowers, they are useful for, 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 for many reasons, but mainly because watchtowers prevent from violence, let's say, because what's the point of having a, a tower? You cannot fill every single watchtower with, with men ready to fight, like, of course. So what the, the point of watchtower is alerting the valleys that something is coming. So this is something like dissuading someone to get into Europe. So this is a sort of dissuasive violence, let's say. It's creating a sense of we're controlling the territory. Don't don't come. We don't, we don't want to fight essentially, but we are ready to fight if, if it's needed. I, I hope this answered the question. Look forward to reading it. What? I look forward to reading the thesis. <laughs> <laughs> well, there are some bits that were not in the thesis. <laughs> well, one. Sorry, one. Oh yes, Gina. Sorry. It, it might be a silly question, but. Uh, warrior of Capestrano, mm -hmm. Capestrano. Yeah. the head-like thing on its head. Is there any possibility that it can be a sh shield? Yeah, that's that has been supposed, but uh, it doesn't fit with the with the sort with the with the statue because actually there is like the the upper part is actually made to actually fit the the the, the head. So it's that 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 part definitely goes on the head, but uh, it's it's a weird one. I something like that. <laughs> it's a region. That That's just a brief question. Is there any study that correlates the traumas to the shape of the weapons? No. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <Brief> there, is, <laughs> there, are, there are some uh, I mean, they, they have been divided between blade, blade yes. traumas and uh, contusive, I think is the word. Um, percussion. Percussion, yes. Yeah, what did you say? <laughs> um, weapons. So they're mostly bladed weapons, but there are some that actually, uh, some of them have been related. There are two cases in uh, Fossa, I think. No, it's it's Batana, I think, where they have a sort of um, percussion, small traumas, and it's on women's head. Uh, and it um, has been connected to um, uh, slinger, uh, oh, the slinger the, the slinger instance. Yeah, that's that's it. So that's, uh, that may be something interesting. But these are very Late uh, skeletons. Well, no, there is none. Yes, but I, I, I have no question. <laughs> I just want to thank you for your talk. It was very interesting, a very new perspective. And because usually we are looking for differences in identities from the uh, equip funerary equipment, and here you have shown us that it is very even. And so your perspective about violence inside uh, and control uh, inside the same unit kind of uh, area that the one you described as, I think it's a very, very interesting new perspective. And, uh, and also every, it's kind of a milieu of which is uh, growing. And then after a big while, we can have differences in names in the communities because at this moment, communities are very alike. I mean, it's different, it's difficult to find differences. We we register during the Roman time. Yeah, I think that those names that we somehow they 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 were perceived from outside. Well, first of all, they were perceived from outside, so we have no idea where they call themselves. But uh, and second, I think it's a very late perspective and. Mm -hmm. At this point, I think it's more fluid. All the the identity here is is more the ethnic identity here is much more fluid than than we usually think. So that's uh, it's a formation. Yeah, exactly. It's a process. It's not it's not a process. process. One last question. <laughs> no, let's go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Yes, I also want to thank you. I think it's 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 a great job. You really compiled a lot of different data. And I just if you could just maybe expand a bit on the violence being formed through memory. How, how do you see that in the data? 
Oh yeah, that's. Uh, I think that this happens essentially looking at the fact that they uh, uh, they they build memory around uh, warrior males burial. So all the tumuli there are related to warrior males, to um, yeah, warrior males, and it's uh, and the warrior of Capistrano I think is the highest example of it. It's uh, just creating uh, a memory and. All the, the graves they're just uh, clustering around these tumuli. So they have the memory of, of someone that is buried there, even after the many generations, it still remains the memory of the one person buried there and is a warrior, he's a male, sometimes there's female also having the 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 the, the tumulus, but the main ones, the, the, the huge ones, they're usually males, and only males uh, grave they've got the tail or the tail of of, of standing stones. So they have much more visibility than mm -hmm. other greys. And I think that this remains throughout the centuries. That it, it arrives, this kind of memory arrives up until the third century, second century BC. So they still have the memory of this of these ancestors. Maybe it was a completely made up memory. Maybe maybe it was nothing related to the reality of that person. But still they had this this memory going on through the centuries. And the word of Capistrano is one of these symbols because it's just um, capturing the memory of one single person depicted as a warrior, and it's it's there, it's set in stone, literally. <laughs> Any final question? Otherwise, I think we've had a very good rehearsal. Sure, <laughs> 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 at least one of the participants has already been present. So thank you so much. I thought that was immensely stimulating. And what I really like is um, the different scales, you, including your own immersive participation as <laughs> someone who knows how to fight in, not in anger, like <laughs> in sport. And I just thank you very much for this presentation. And we, we can now... You know,